And I happen to be partners with some of not just the wealthiest men in the world, but the smartest men I've ever met in my life. What work-life balance in your observation look like, you know, and billionaires that you know? The cost of energy has been um, has been the driving force of uh, national security. If you said you got so. lucky. Do you feel like you got lucky or you work yourself up? The next question is a personal question. Um, I know you work a lot, uh, or I don't know a lot, but I know you work with the Russian oligarchs. Uh, Russian oligarchs in Russia and the United States are a very controversial group of people. Some people think their wealth is at, at question and stuff. I want to ask you, like, uh, you're the only person who knows, I know who knows Ru Russian oligarchs. Uh, what are they like to work with? To um, to do business with. <laughs> well, I've had many of them here. I've had some of the largest um, Russian businessmen sitting around um, uh, in these chairs. Uh, Roman Abramovich was sitting in the chair you're sitting in here in this in this thing with a group uh, here when we started um, American Ethane. And um, uh, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, with America and Russia, um, as you well know. Um, and, you know, my family is 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 half Russian, and um, uh, and, and there's a lot of misunderstanding between our countries. A lot of it, some of it's true and some of it's propaganda. It's like everything. The, the truth is usually in the middle. Um, the businessmen that I am associated with, my partners that I've been in the past, um, are um, extreme entrepreneurs. You know, when there's a misunderstanding about what happened in Russia when the country fell down, you know, um, the whole country fell down. Uh, and there was coupons and people were entrepreneurial and bought up coupons and, and bought companies and things and got loans and did stuff and became very wealthy as a result of it. Um, the Russian businessmen I know are very hardworking, extremely. Uh, some of the smartest, I happen to be partners with some of not just the wealthiest men in the world, but the smartest men I've ever met in my life. Um, they didn't get there by accident. Uh, they got there by being very, very smart. So. And, and working very hard and being, um, there's a, you know, there's a trait, you know, you know, there's countries and populations and things have different traits, but there is a very, very hardworking trait that runs through a lot of Russian uh, people, in part because of uh, how difficult it has been. You know, the, you know, in, in Russia, the, the women out, rank that you know there's more many more women than there are men because of all of the wars that have been fought uh, as a consequence in Russia so it's been difficult um, in my case I became partners with some of these people because uh, of the oil and gas industry uh, and the shale formations that we have in the United States um, there's been of course lots of reports of you know uh, John Hotelling uh, being um, partners with Russian oligarchs and former chiefs of staff of Putin and things like this. And uh, some of that is true, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the investment that they were looking at to do was investment in America. They were looking at and have, have been, you know, I have been facilitating the taking money from Russia and investing it into critical infrastructure in the United States um, that, uh, that, that helps the security of the U.S. You know, um, and for, for more, than, more than 60 years, energy, the cost of energy uh, has, been, um, has been the driving force of uh, national security. And, and um, you know, this home that we're in was the, the first home that was electrified in, uh, in Louisiana. The home that we that we're sitting in here um, it was built in 1905. Uh, it was no It was built. It was started in 1899, and it was finished in 1904. Um, but it was one of the first ones where you had uh, electricity. And at the time, it's interesting if you go through the house, uh, it had uh, backups of gas because we didn't know if this they, at the time they didn't know if this electricity thing was going to catch on. Yeah. Kind of funny, but of course uh, now what has happened. Um, is that um, uh, the cost of energy, it, it is the, the relative cost of energy is what makes economies grow or not grow across the nation. Um, and the United States in 
uh, recent years has now has the cheapest energy in the world. Um, and we are now making alliances with different countries, emerging markets, on the export of that energy, of export of gas in particular. Um, and this is a new thing because we used to be a net importer of oil and gas, and now we're a net exporter. We're now the largest supplier of, of natural gas in the world. When that was changing, my partners in Russia realized that some of this stuff was changing before companies in America did. And they had a very big insight as to part, at least the ethane portion of how this works. Um, they looked at the macro markets in a way that was different. And when I first became partners with them, a lot of billionaire oil and gas people in the United States from Houston looked at them very, oh, who are these guys coming here? Uh, are they here based upon, they're here with money, but are they here based on merit? Um, and the, my, my partner saw things and that they didn't, that the people in the America didn't. And I wondered why, and, and later I figured out why. And it was because when Russia collapsed, there are certain people that look at big macro markets and look at what, because the rules are gone and they changed and they could see markets and they could see the things that happen in a very, very um, smart way, in a macro way, um, and not looking at the way things done. And that was a big change in the economy of Russia. And certain people excelled at that. In the United States, we had a similar thing where the changing of the entire oil and gas industry changed with shale completely. All the old rules had to be thrown out. And so there was an analogous situation that my partners saw. And so we, you know, and we worked with the United States government um, of, they were happy about this, that these Russian oligarchs were taking money out of Russia and investing in the United States and investing in critical infrastructure that would then supply China. You know, somebody's gonna supply China now. Uh, it's either gonna be Russia or it's gonna be the United States. We're gonna be supplying the energy of virtual pipelines to China. May I invite Mr. John Hotelling, the second CEO of American Lithane Company? Uh, through shipping and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's a, I found that they're really very hardworking and very smart, and I've learned, I've learned a lot from my Russian a, a, a lot of people think about oligarchs or, you know, the richest people in the world. The perception is uh, they live this luxury lifestyle. W what work-life balance in your observation look like, you know, billionaires that you know, Russian or American? Is it different? Is it, do they sleep four hours or do they four hours a day or do they, you know, spend all their time on Bahamas, <laughs> you know, when they can't? Um, I think people are, you know, I think it's a mistake though, to, you know, although there's certain traits that are the similar uh, in populations, I think it's a trait to say, oh, because someone's Russian, they're like this, or they're different. I think people are different. Um, the businessmen that I know, the billionaires that I know, um, are not billionaires by accident. Um, they're billionaires because they saw things that other people didn't. They could look forward that, uh, and see big market changes before others. They were leaders, uh, visionaries. Uh, Elon Musk is a great example. Um, of somebody that didn't just look at this, what was happening now, was looking forward, was looking at the big picture of things. And then not just having the big picture, but having the drive to push it forward. So most, most billionaires that I know or that, uh, that I'm in business with um, share the trait of, of looking at that, but then also having the drive to put it through. Um, to get to the, I've seen in my life, extreme different levels of wealth. Um, and it's very interesting. And my, 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 when I was born, my, uh, my family was on food assistance. Uh, and uh, the first four years of my father, my, 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 of, of being alive, my father made less than $1,500. Uh, he made like $37 a year I was born or something like that. Um, so I've, I've, and then I've got lucky and and had some breaks and some things and have seen different levels. You said levels. you got lucky. Do you feel like you got lucky or you worked yourself up? Of course, the biggest thing is luck. The biggest thing is luck. Absolutely. Blue. Of course. How, it, how did you get lucky? I was, I happen, I, I'm, and I think this is a mistake. You know, people think oh, it's not luck, it's work. Yeah. Well, let's look at that. Um, I could have been born of, 
a difficult family in India. I am not responsible for my parents or who I was born to. I happened to be born uh, at this time in America. I could have been born uh, at a different time. I could have been born African American in this country when this home was built. I wasn't. I was happened to be lucky to be born, um, although I was not lucky to be born of a family of wealth, I was lucky to be born with a family that had a good work ethic. Uh, I got the DNA from my parents uh, of a work ethic, and I had parents that, that uh, spent money on my education. That was lucky. That's not my, res you know, the, the rearing that I got was, was that's not my, I can't take credit for that, right? Um, I was born healthy. Um, I've stayed, I've been lucky to be healthy. Um, I've, uh, so I see luck. We don't give credit enough for our luck. We don't recognize the, light, the luck plays in us that um, I could have been born a person that was lazy. I could have been born a person that had mental, you know, more mental challenges than I do. Um, so I see myself as appreciative and lucky. In that sense, you would know? you would you agree that uh, we live in uh, one of the best times to to have business? I mean, if you live in the United States in 2021, you know, like with the phones, with the technology, the learning curves, like you, you can learn and achieve almost anything. Like internet, would you agree that it's the best times to be alive as a business owner, as an entrepreneur? Um. Those are just different questions there. Is it the best time or is it the best time to be an entrepreneur? Um, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur um, and I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole life. Um, and, uh, but with uh, the drive to be an entrepreneur is the drive of being unsatisfied. Um, you know, what uh, I thought was rich or that I would get as an entrepreneur, um, you get there that you envision what it would like to be, to be wealthy or to be things and your definition of wealth when you're at a certain thing is one thing. When you get there, you no longer think wealthy. You don't think you're wealthy. Because why? Your perspective changes. Um, to uh, somebody making $60,000 a year, uh, having car payments and the house of their things, um, to you or I, that might not seem like a wealthy person. To someone in India, it may be. In Bangladesh, that person seems incredibly wealthy. When you get to certain levels as an entrepreneur, one of the things is there's the result of being unsatisfied. You're here, but now you have a drive to go again, and I go again, and I go again. You know, there's a drive to be a millionaire, but once you get to be a millionaire, your drive isn't to be a millionaire, it's to be worth 10 million. When you get there, your drive is to be worth 20. When you get to 20, what motivates your drive is to be you? What, what's your drive? What's, what's your why? What, what drives you? Um, you know, I think that. Every human being, like you have part of you that is unsatisfied with their status quo. You want to go more. You want. You have a craving. We, we are animals in the end of it. We have a cravings for things, um, and um, uh, and I think that's part of it. I, what drives me, uh, has changed kind of over the years. You know what what what. Um, you know you have a drive to get to a certain level, and then you have a drive to get to a different level, and then you get there. You have friends then or that level and you look up. There's all, life is relative. Wealth is relative. Your comfort is relative uh, in things. Um, at some point, though, many people, not billionaires, I would take them out of the equation, but many people get to the point where they either go, you know, if they're, if they're really lucky, really lucky, they get to the point in their personality where they say, you know, this is good. I'm happy here. I want to be satisfied and I want to be secure where I am. Enjoy my life. Enjoy my friends. Enjoy the things that I'm doing. Um, I think that imagine what it takes to get to a billionaire. You've got to be unsatisfied with $50 million in the bank. You've got to be unsatisfied with $100 million. You've got to be satisfied with $200 million. You can do almost, you can do a lot of things with this kind, with this kind of money. Uh, you've got to be, so you have to be a drive to go further. So when you say is, you know, are these people happy or lucky? I don't know that the wealth determines that or necessarily your comfort. 
absolutely enjoyed this interview guys if you like um, john's content give it a like subscribe to the channel comment below something nice to john if maybe you have a question we'll be answering monitoring comments later thank you so much for staying all the way to the end great thank thanks. you sir thanks